what is the value of not being a racist if you are receiving the rewards of systemic racism and not challenging that as the status quo? All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me on Strive Conversations, talking about compassionate leadership in the age of anti-racism. My name is Melissa Tele, and I'm the founder of Strive With Me, which is a platform making personal development and social change more accessible to busy people, and also your host for Strive Conversations, which is where we like to make uncomfortable topics about personal development and social change a little bit more comfortable. And I'm very excited for our amazing speaker tonight, uh, Magdalene. She's an incredible human being, professional. She's going to share a little bit about herself because I don't think I can do it justice. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Magali Renee. I am a corporate facilitator, a facilitator, a speaker, and an author. I am super committed to compassionate leadership. I really believe the future of work is compassionate and everything that I talk about, um, everything that I do really comes out of that. So as we are moving into an age of taking control uh, and changing paradigms around how we look at race in this country, in our organization, in our organizations, in uh, our businesses, it's really important in my opinion, it is very, very important to begin at the beginning. And we begin with foundational principles and compassion is the first place to start. Compassion for yourself, compassion for others. And in that you become the kind of leader who creates the culture and the environment within which people can thrive and strive, right? So I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited to be jumping into this conversation about how compassionate, what compassionate leadership is uh, and what anti-racism is, if you are not familiar, and even if you are, how those two things come together. So very excited to be here. Thanks yeah. for having and, me. And thank you, we're, we're gonna jump right in to that and, and kind of really break it down. That's one of the things that I've been learning a lot as we're having this conversation is, um, uh, there are certain terms that are very, um, very popular. They're also very like emotionally charged and we need to like kind of almost break that down because not everyone has the same understanding, right? Especially when you're like trained and you're very knowledgeable in this and this is your life's work and or your life's experience. It's very different for someone that may not have shared that experience. So before I jump into the questions, we want you to be a part of this conversation with us in the chat box. So please um, as I uh, as, uh, ask these questions, if you have an answer, if you have an experience, please feel free to share that in the chat because we want to hear from you as well. Um, and then if we have room at the end, uh, we will be able to kind of bring up some of those questions. So we're going to get started with, let's talk about what is compassionate leadership. Okay, so if you guys, I'm sure you went to the Eventbrite and you signed up for this. So really, we, we explained it in the Eventbrite listing for this event, and I'm going to go over that again. It, compassionate leaders are the kinds of people who grow and develop their people and the communities they serve. So they listen actively, they're empathetic, they're emotionally intelligent, they are outward focused, they get that it's not about me. They understand the, the, the outward focus and they understand that it's really about the collective and they're committed to, to challenging themselves and to challenging narratives that would have them stuck right they are innovative and they're really committed to and they're they they are all those ways so that they can grow their people so that they can develop their businesses so that they can be innovative so yeah so i think that that's such an interesting way for you to put it because i feel like for me um i'm a huge personal development nerd i love studying like leaders and i think that they make such a big difference yeah. um and now in the age, as we like title this event, in the age of anti-racism, leadership looks different than, than maybe the normal day-to-day. -day. 
And so before we, just as we define compassion and leadership, let's talk about what anti-racism is because there's a difference between anti-racist and being not being racist. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, I think, so there was something that you just said that really kind of like stuck a chord for me, uh, which is that now we're being asked to approach leadership in a different way. And yes and no. At the end of the day, I think there is a successful and effective leader. And then there is a leader who is not effective, right? So there's an effective and an ineffective leader. And I would actually say, I would challenge the idea that all of a sudden, in order to be a good leader, you've got to be a compassionate leader now. I think this has always been the case. And I think the best leaders have always been the ones who have leaned into the ways of being versus doing. Um, and that now is ever more important now, but it isn't a new thing. In order to be a successful manager, you've always had to relate to your employees. In order to be a colleague that people want to be around, that gets support from their team, that is contributing in the best way, the kinds of people that people are like, yeah, let's go out with this person, let's hang out and get a beer after work. Like, you've always had to be the kind of person who knows how to relate to many different types of people. Mm -hmm. And that is compassionate leadership. So now that we're in this age of anti-racism, I'm gonna dig into the answer to your question, which is that, um, you know, I'm gonna get graphic here for a moment. So I don't wanna trigger anyone, but I think it's very important to make this visceral and make this real. So I'm prefacing by saying if you're, if this is going to make you, this is potentially triggering. So be present to that and put me on mute if that's going to support you. Um, I'll put my hand up once I'm done talking about it, but it's about rape, right? So I'm starting right now, putting my hand up. Um, if you were at a party and you heard someone being assaulted in the next room, you knew what was going on and you didn't do anything about it. Does that make you a rapist? Absolutely not. You're not the rapist, but you're not an anti-rapist, mm. right? And so you're bystanding. It's a very visceral, graphic way to put this. Mm -hmm. And generally, I tend to come at this from a very light place, but I think it's really important to understand the difference between I am not a racist. So I'm gonna put my hand up because I'm done talking about the graphic thing. Mm -hmm. So I am not, a racist, but what is the value of not being a racist if you are receiving the rewards of systemic racism and not challenging that as the status quo, not leaning in and taking action to do something to create a unified world, to create a society where we, are, we have equity and we are equal. So does that, does that explain it? That's so interesting you say that because when we talk about it, um, so yes, you're not, um, like you're not a racist if you like see that, but you're also not anti-racist. So I think that there are people that are not like, uh, we talked about like being not being racist and being anti-racist is a, is a very proactive choice. And then now yeah. I'm also curious with your example, and I, and I don't want to bring up it too much, but like, how does that differentiate from being a bystander and an enabler? Because I think that when it comes to, similar to the example you've given, which we don't have to go into, uh, because we don't want anyone to um, kind of be triggered by it, but more so um, there are people that, like, like I've grown up like friends, when we didn't know, we would say things, and then it was like, oh, ha, 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 that didn't feel right with me. And that was an attack on someone but I don't know if it's my place to say anything. And I know it's a little off script, but I'm curious to hear about like, like the action. No, I think it's super important. I think it's important. I think that, that we're looking now at, this is a paradigm shift that's happening mm. culturally, societally, in organizations, in the micro, in the home, in your, with your friends, with your network, and it's happening globally and universally, right? So many huge shifts are happening. So we're in a new moment. And I like to think about, life and creating the world that I want from this moment. I use the past to inform me and then I decide from this moment forward, what do I want to create? So right now we're in a moment where allyship, being an ally, what does that really mean? 
Mm. I, I, I feel like we're on this precipice of creating this new world, this new organization, this new human, right? And perhaps this human is compassionate. Perhaps this organization is compassionate. Perhaps this ally is active. Perhaps the changes that we want to make in the world we want to create, perhaps that no longer, it's no longer enough in this moment to simply say, I am not this bad thing. We're in a new time where it's an opportunity to do something new, to behave differently, to engage in a way that we haven't before, because now we're creating these new meetings and new definitions around mm -hmm. some of these age old terms, right? Yep. Ally has been around forever. Comrade has been around forever. Friend forever, right? But what does that mean now? Yeah. How do I get to operate right now? And it's also not about self beat up. So I want to address the if there have been moments where you haven't said anything where you've been a bystander um where you've been not racist but you haven't been anti-racist mm -hmm. this is an opportunity again not to use the past to beat ourselves up and make ourselves wrong there's enough of that in the world this is an opportunity to, to use that to inform us as to how we're going to operate moving forward which is very exciting and inspiring and it isn't about shame or blame or guilt it's about I see this. This is new. I've been climbing this mountain. Uh, I had a, an astrology session last night and I had it. I, I, it's one of the things that I do in my Facebook group. It's a thing. But we did astrology for entrepreneurs. And one of the analogies that my resident expert astrologer used was it's okay to climb up a mountain, be halfway there to the peak, look up and say, you know, I think I'm climbing the wrong mountain. I don't think I want to climb this mountain anymore. It doesn't feel good anymore. It doesn't inspire me anymore. It is, it's dark. It's angry. It's heavy. It's scary. I don't want to climb this mountain. I'm going to go down and climb another mountain. So we all get to look. The mountain is not the thing that changes, right? It's just how we decide to engage with the mountain, right? We can go down without self beat up, climb a new mountain. And that's how I look at allyship and friendship and, and anti-racism because it's just a term, right? Yeah. People are getting super caught up in like that term. Yeah. Um, and it's really just about being active, proactive. Exactly. And I, and I think it's, it's interesting as we kind of set the foundation for this conversation um, and I'm seeing more and more people say like, like you can't give yourself that title of an ally. You have to like earn that. And by earning that, it's through those actions and being proactive. And I just want to click one last term I want to go into because a lot of us are having these kind of conversations and the word that keeps popping up is empathy. And I feel like empathy is such a big part of compassion. Um, and it's also a big part of leadership as well. So can you break down what empathy looks like? Because there's an argument between empathy and sympathy um, so what is empathy? How is that different from sympathy? And what does that all look, what does empathy look like in a leadership role? So I don't have an intellectual answer for this, but I definitely have one that's very practical. And I'm going to attempt, since it's already 320, ah, I'm going to attempt to keep this brief so that we can get to more questions. So I think some people mistake sympathy and tenderness for empathy. So sympathy and tenderness are both emotional, right? They have like an emotional component to it. And I would actually argue that empathy doesn't need to be emotional. A lot of people, depending on where you fall on the, any number of the personality tests, right? Uh, Myers-Briggs or DISC, you may not be an emotional person and that's okay. It actually doesn't require, yeah, empathy doesn't require an emotional response. Um, although I do think in corporate spaces, it would be wise to begin to integrate head and heart, which is what I'm talking about with compassion. But I think empathy is about perspective shift again. Mm -hmm. It moves us out of the, oh, that's too bad for you, to instead curiosity. And perhaps asking the question, how can I better understand or relate to where this person is coming from? Perhaps asking yourself that question can begin to have you move into empathy without attaching it to emotion or getting caught up in how am I supposed to be acting right now? Yeah. It's not about acting. It's really about asking yourself, how can I understand and better relate to where someone is coming from? Um, and then on the back end of that, how can I now communicate with this person in a way that has them experience 
being seen and heard has them see that it was my intention to understand and relate to them. That's how I look at empathy. Yeah, it's interesting um, because uh, Christina just asked, can you define ally really quickly? Uh, well, I think ally has meant a lot of different things over the course of, of centuries, decades, over the course of time. Right now in this moment, I think an ally is someone who takes an active role and is an active participant in the well-being of someone they are allied with. So if your friend is being hurt, then as a friend and as an ally, what would you do, right? You would protect that friend. You would call it out. You would be in active support. You would be in active defense. You would be engaged in what we're now calling allyship. So I think of ally as an act active, active well-being, active support. Thanks for watching and thanks in advance for helping me grow this channel by subscribing. Hit the subscribe button, share this with friends, share this with anyone you think would get value. And in the meantime, I'm committed to bringing you more powerful content on how you can face your fears and find your shine. Until next time.